SIDH with arbitrary degree isogenies by uh, Craig Costello and Hussein Hussein. Craig will do that. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. So yeah, as we saw um, yesterday in the best paper talk, isogeny-based uh, isogeny crypto is more general nowadays than just Diddy Hellman. Um, so we could title this isogeny-based crypto with arbitrary degree isogenies, but um, Certainly, Diffie Hellman, based on isogenies, is the, the most popular um, instantiation of, of isogeny based crypto. Why is it so popular? Uh, well, going back to Diffie Hellman, the first instantiation in the 70s, we've got Diffie and Hellman just saying to do uh, integer arithmetic modulo Q in a multiplicative group. And exchanging these, uh, this base point G to the power of their, both of their secrets um, and, and doing Diffie Hellman that way. And then Koblitz and Miller came along 10 years later. Um, and said, instead of doing it this way, why don't we use the group of, of points on an elliptic curve? So rather than trading these integers, we're going to trade points on elliptic curves um, on a fixed and well-chosen elliptic curve that has high uh, ECDLP security. But as you saw in Dustin's talk, both of these first variants um, are going to fall victim to, to quantum attacks should a large-scale quantum computer ever be built. So some many years later, Jao and Maffei proposed not to just stay fixed on a fixed elliptic curves and just trade points, but rather to, um, rather to move about elliptic curves, so to compute isogenies between elliptic curves um, in this super singular isogeny graph. So this is the story that, that we're dealing with today in SIDH. And this is the cheat sheet that I always show in, in SIDH talks um, that I would say if you don't take anything else away from the talk, this is kind of the one thing you should remember at least to try and put it in perspective of what you're used to seeing with Diffie-Hellman. So um, in traditional, in these red, in these red uh, quantum insecure variants, um, you're used to seeing the, the base elements being integers modulo of prime, the secret exponents being integers, um, the fundamental computation is this exponentiation in the group, uh, and the hard problem is the discrete log problem. Okay, point on elliptic curve, it's exactly the same thing, but we're, our group elements are point on elliptic curve. We still do this um, exponentiation in the group that we call the scalar multiplication. Over here in SIDH land, it's a bit different now. Our, our elements are um, curves in the super singular isogeny class, so the, the, the fundamental computation now is different. So our secrets in SIDH are isogenies, um, and the fundamental computation is given, a, given an elliptic curve, um, what you do is you use your secret isogeny and you apply it to that elliptic curve to move about in the isogeny graph um, to, this, to this image curve 5e. So then the hard problem here is given, given the, the base curve and the image curve, you want to know what that secret isogeny was. Um, again, in all of these scenarios, this, the, the story is a little more complicated. As you'll see in Christoph's talk next, this isn't the actual hard problem we use, but it's basically the, the fundamental underlying hard problem. There's additional information in SIDH, um, and of course we do decisional variants and sort of um, Diffie Hellman variants of these problems, but basically this is the, this is the scenario we're dealing with in, S in SIDH. So I've pinched this um, really nice GIF from Walter Kastrick, who uh, wrote a, a blog post recently about um, SIDH. I, I encourage anyone that's interested to go and read that blog. But this is the story uh, with SIDH. This is how it works. So basically, what we're dealing with, the setting here is the super singular isogeny class over FP squared. So as soon as you go and fix a prime P, um, you've got this big, uh, this big isogeny class of curves that are all connected in a, in a well-connected regular graph. Um, so if you like, and you don't want to think about the elliptic curve jargon, you can kind of abstract away from that. Um, and just think of SIDH in the graph theoretic sense. So there's a bunch of points in this, for, for a fixed P, and we're going to have an exponentially large P, there's roughly P over 12 isomorphism classes in that, in the super singular isogeny class. And the public parameters is this starting curve E that Alice and Bob both start on. Um, what Alice is going to do is, is choose a secret subgroup on that starting curve, and in turn that determines a secret isogeny, which is, in this case, a secret walk through the isogeny graph. So she's going to take little, little tiny steps of baby isogenies all along the way to eventually have a, to compute an exponentially large isogeny and, and land on E sub A over here. She's going to send that curve to Bob. Bob's going to do the same thing, send Alice E sub B. And then they're both going to compute um, a, a related secret sub, subgroup on each other's curves. 
and use that to walk to the same target curve here. So that's kind of uh, SIDH without getting into the nitty gritty details. It's, it's, the computation we're doing here is a bunch of little isogeny computations um, to do one exponentially large isogeny computation. Okay? So, um, in the theme of stealing <coughs> nice pictures from the Lurman crew, this is another nice picture I stole from, from Frey. Um, this is a this is an isogeny graph when the prime is 241. So this is a very small toy example. And there's 20 nodes in this graph. So as I said, roughly P over 12 nodes in the uh, isogeny graph. And we can assume here that we're Alice. So what Alice is going to do is she's going to use two isogenies. Um, so in SIDH currently, we use two and three isogenies. Alice uses two isogenies or two to the E isogenies and Bob uses uh, three isogenies. So here, um, as we'll, we'll see the reason why in a couple of slides, but basically if, if you're doing two isogenies, each one of these nodes is connected to three other nodes, so it has three edges in the graph. Um, so each, these, these nodes are uh, isomorphism classes of elliptic curves or J invariants that, that represent the isomorphism class and then what we're going to do is a bunch of computations at each node and eventually Alice is going to come down to have a, a, a choice of three two torsion points and then in, in choosing that two torsion point uh, she's going to move in, in one of those three directions. So Alice and Bob deal with the same graph. On the next slide, it's exactly the same set of nodes. It's just Bob has a different set of edges here. So Bob, instead of having uh, each isomorphism or each node connected to, to three other nodes, he's going to use three isogenies where uh, there's, there's four cyclic subgroups of order three that Bob can choose, and he's going to have a choice of, um, of, of four different uh, base that, or little, little isogeny jumps at each, from each node. Okay? So, this is the, um, kind of the, the only thing you need to know, at, at least with respect to, to this talk, um, as far as the correspondence between isogenies and subgroups. It's kind of a very important point. Um, so, what is an isogeny, first of all? Uh, you can think of it in either a geometric or an algebraic sense. So geometrically, it's a, it's a map from points on a, in our case, from points on an elliptic curve to points on another elliptic curve. Uh, but algebraically, it's also a group homomorphism um, between the two groups. In this talk, we're going to be dealing with separable uh, isogeny. So you can think of computing an isogeny. You can you can uh, equate it to determining if any finite subgroup on the on the um, the starting curve E. So as soon as you fix a finite subgroup on the, on the first curve, that uniquely up to isomorphism determines an isogeny and the image curve, which we write E sub G. You might see that as E prime in the later slides. But essentially there's this one-to-one -one correspondence between um, subgroups on E and isogenies. So if you want to compute, in this case I've given a toy example here of a, of a tiny super singular elliptic curve over F11 squared. Um, if you want to compute a three isogeny, it's group order is divisible by three, so we're going to have rational three isogenies here. Here's our starting elliptic. Here's our starting elliptic curve. If you want to compute a three isogeny on that um, elliptic curve, you can look at any of the cyclic subgroups of <coughs> three. So, in this case, there's four of them, and any one of those subgroups will give rise to a different isogeny. Okay, so if I choose this this subgroup here, I'm going to take. Um, I'm going to get, end up on this image curve E1, and this is my map that, that takes us to E1. Um, and so that, this, having four options here, in the case of three isogenies, corresponds to this previous picture where at each, at each node you've got four, four um, options, and in the, in the two isogeny case we've got, we've got three cyclic subgroups of order two. Okay, so now the rest of the talk is essentially talking about how to, um, how to compute these isogenies um, in cases where we're not dealing with L equals 2 or L equals 3. So the way, we've, the way we know how to compute isogenies, given a, given a finite subgroup on the, on the starting curve, is with Valu's formulas. Okay, so if you input into Valu's formulas, so we're starting on this curve E, we input into Valu's formulas the, the, the curve constants that define the curve, uh, A and B, and we also specify the subgroup G that, that determines the isogeny. Bailey's formulas will magically give you the uh, image curve, so the, the two coefficients of, of E prime, uh, A prime and B prime, and it will also tell you how to map points from E to E sub G, uh, to E uh, quotient G. So it will also define these uh, polynomials that talk about how to, how to move points from E 
under that isogeny to, to uh, E quotient G. So in SIDH we need to do both of these things. We need to, we need to um, from, our, from our starting curve, we need to be able to define what these polynomials are and we need to be able to um, update the, the curve coefficients on the, to give the image curve. That's how we walk around that isogeny graph. The only other thing I'll say is um, in the setup is that in, in optimized implementations of SIDH, um, we liked, well, we've, we've um, in our implementation, we've figured out that you can actually do both point and isogeny uh, arithmetic in the projective space of dimension one. Um, and so if you're dealing with elliptic curves over, or any curves over fields, um, it's kind of as simple as it gets, P1. So we, we've always known that you can do, or since the days of, of Montgomery's paper, we know that you can do um, X only arithmetic. That was kind of the basis of the, of the last talk. So we typically, rather than dealing with affine points, we move into projective space. And then Montgomery said we don't really need, or at least Miller in, in his seminal paper said you, we don't need the Y-coordinate to do Diffie-Hellman. And then Montgomery said if we're dealing on Montgomery curves, we can drop the Y-coordinate and, and, and do things very efficiently. Um, but in SIDH, we not only have to do uh, point arithmetic on a fixed curve, we have to do that and we have to move between curves in the, uh, in the isogeny class. So you can also do a somewhat kind of analog of that but in the curve world. So instead of dealing with the, the coefficients A and B, we're going to kind of use them, cast them into projective space to avoid doing inversions. And then because this B coefficient on Montgomery curves just determines the, um, the twist, which twist you're working on, we can drop that uh, because that's uh, the, the, the isomorphism class is independent of which quadratic twist you're on. Okay, so all the arithmetic we want to do is going to be in P1. Okay, so as I said, the motivation here is um, all of the SID, all of the SIDH uh, and isogeny implementations to date have dealt with Alice can doing two to, two to the e isogenies and Bob do this should be three to the e prime. These e's are different. We choose these to be roughly the same size. Um, to, two to the e is roughly the same size as three to the e prime. Uh, but, but to date, it's just been two and three. So we wanted to look at what happens in the Montgomery curves when we, um, when we move to odd L where L is bigger than two or three. Um, and the other thing I should say is we're dealing with cyclic isogenies here. So generated by one, uh, by the subgroup generated by one element. Okay, by, by the generator. So now this is the problems we immediately run into. So when we venture beyond degrees two and three, um, there's problems with, with just applying Bailu's formulas out of the textbook to Montgomery curves. The first one is that they look really, really nasty and, and complicated. So um, these are the, this is the maps that take uh, coordinates. Say if, I'm, if I've fixed my point, my, the generator of my kernel P, um, these, are the, these are the coordinate maps that will take a point on E to a point on E prime. And what I have to do here is I have to cycle through the subgroup generated by P and compute this expression um, to move the x-coordinate and compute this expression to move the y-coordinate. Um, and so when you come to try to uh, optimize or to try and um, compute these things fast in practice, the way that it stands here in, in this sort of additive case um, is kind of, it's, it's computationally costly and it's not very nice. The other, the other thing that kind of makes this um, difficult to use is that they lose formulas don't really preserve the Montgomery form. So, um, if, I, if my starting curve E is in Montgomery form, there's no guarantee that this E prime will also be in Montgomery form. In fact, it won't happen. So typically we land on an image curve that looks like this, but our A4 is not 1 and our A6 is not 0, so it's not in the, the form we want. We're going to have to use some sort of isomorphism to convert it to Montgomery form. Um, but in practice, this often requires that we compute some sort of square root or some, solve, some, um, solve some polynomial equation over the field, which is way too expensive. So that's, that's the problems that we were trying to, um, trying to overcome and, and I suppose this is, if, if there was one slide that sums up the whole talk, this is the slide. Um, so the theorem, theorem 1 is kind of the crux of the paper. Um, if we've got a, a, a point P of odd order L on a Montgomery curve, um, then there's an isogeny that, that is relative to the isogeny on the previous slide, relative to the Bailey's formulas on the previous slide is <coughs> very, very simple. So it'll take the point X, Y on, the, on E to a, a, a point with these coordinates on E prime, where f of x is just this um, this this uh, product here um, of x evaluated at um, terms that are determined by all of the l points um, all of the l points in the in the kernel of, of p. Okay, so 
It also, the, the theorem also guarantees that the image curve is Montgomery, which is what we want. Um, and computationally, it's already a lot, a lot more simple than, than uh, values formulas out of the textbook. So there was a lot of work that went into deriving this. Um, initially, a lot of emails between Hussain and I that uh, ended up with arriving at this formula. And then I think, as well, the crux of the paper is the proof of why this works. And there was a lot of emails between Hussain and I and between um, Stephen, who gave us a lot of help uh, proving this, this, that this formula actually works um, and that it's mathematically true. So the, the, the theorem is kind of stated in general terms over a general field, but we wanted to, we wanted to apply it, of course, to, um, to SIDH. So recall that in SIDH we can, we can drop the Y coordinate and we can ignore what the V coordinate was. So we really only, we're kind of working on these question varieties that you saw in the previous talk. Um, and so we're really only interested in how fast we can compute this map from, or, or we can evaluate the isogeny under this map and how fast we can compute the uh, coefficient on the isogenous curve. So the first thing I should say is that because we're dealing in an odd cyclic subgroup, um, the uh, x-coordinate of the i multiple of p is the same as the x-coordinate of the l minus i multiple of p. Um, so we, we don't have to, we don't have to cycle <coughs> all the way up to l or l minus 1. We can go halfway. Um, and then just square these products, they're going to be the same value. Um, and the next thing, of course, is that we want to deal in projective space to avoid inversions. So then we get these, uh, when we're evaluating at the point, uh, the projective point x, x colon z on, on E, the updated coordinates on the, on the image curve are, are given by these expressions. And anyone that's familiar with um, Montgomery arithmetic will realize that these are, these are exactly the formulae that appear in the, in the differential Montgomery additions, or at least each sub subterm in these, um, each each component of these products is exactly the uh, the form that we're used to dealing with. And it was Montgomery that realised instead of computing a multiplication here, a multiplication here, and two more over here, we can instead just do only uh, only two multiplications. So we can we can subtract z from x, add z to x, and then do this, the same thing with the um, with the kernel points. In each, in each part of the product, and then all we've got, the only difference between these two terms on the numerator and denominator is the, this change of sign. So we really only need four, uh, sorry, two multiplications to compute all of this for each, each value in the product, and then at the end we've got this, um, this final product and a, and a squaring too. So when it comes to putting all this into a nice uh, simple, simple algorithm, it looks, it looks quite compact and quite easy compared to what we would ordinarily do in, with Bayley's formulas. Um, there's kind of no telling if we were to just do Bayley's formulas how, how complicated it would be. But in, in, uh, in the Montgomery case and with this, with this theorem as it is, it's very, very simple. So if we input the generator of our kernel and we input an element that we want to uh, evaluate uh, the isogeny at, then all we have to do is um, cycle through all the multiples of, of P in the kernel and then each time we simply compute, we absorb this, um, this part of the product into x prime and z prime and at the very end we square it and then multiply by the original points. Um, so I think each time I think we're incurring sort of four multiplications uh, for, each, for each value in the kernel. So we can kind of already here see that L is allowed to be, well, L can be arbitrary up to something um, reasonable. So we can choose L to be 5, 7, 9 and so on um, and still compute this somewhat efficiently. The only other thing I'll say is, uh, uh, before getting to kind of applications or potential applications, is there's another part of the paper that discusses um, a trick we could do to avoid having to compute the isogenous curve. So if you recall the theorem, um, the theorem said that we compute the updated curve coefficient A prime like this, um, but this kind of, the, the, the larger L gets, so the larger, um, larger degree isogenies, this updating the curve coefficient gets more and more expensive relatively to, relative to computing um, to evaluating the isogeny of points. So one trick we can use is to sort of see this like very simple correspondence between um, two torsion points on Montgomery curves uh, and the curve coefficient A. So rather than looking at how A becomes updated into A prime, we're just going to evaluate the isogeny at two torsion points. So A is just a, A relates to the two torsion point like this on the on the domain curve, and on the codomain curve it's going to be exactly the same thing. So we just push that two torsion point 
through the odd degree isogeny, it'll still have order two on the um, on the domain curve. But then we can not have to compute the updated curve like this anymore. We can essentially use exactly the same function um, with a, with the modification in the on the image curve to, to, to find that constant if we need it. So we, we really only need one function to do these odd degree isogenies, not not two. Now here's one potential upshot. So the the overall upshot is that we're not really restricted to um, two and three isogenies anymore. We could do uh, SIDH with, um, as the title says, arbitrary, but still let's keep it kind of small degrees. Um, and I should say that, uh, as I said before at the, at the start, that we try to um, we try to keep these uh, at least Alice's power of two and Bob's power of uh, Bob's power of three relatively balanced. Okay, so those are about the same size. Um, so some re recent work by Boss and Friedberger showed that, at least in their implementation, they were able to achieve faster um, underlying field arithmetic by using um, 19 to the power of 88, which is about the same size as 3 to the 239. For whatever reason, that, that, um, that prime proved to be faster when they were doing their, their underlying field arithmetic. So here, you could imagine, um, any, as I said at the top, that our, uh, as L grows large, of course, we have to do less 19 isogenies. We, we might only have to do 88 of them rather than 239 three isogenies. But as L grows large, um, that isogeny computation becomes more and more uh, expensive, relatively speaking. But if this field arithmetic was faster than this field arithmetic, then you could imagine a situation where um, you, still, you still let some party suffer the slower 19 isogenies to give the other party, Alice, much faster two isogenies or the somewhat faster two isogenies because uh, she's working over the, a, a somewhat faster field. So you can imagine a situation like a client server in the real world where the server's the bottleneck, um, giving the server the luxury of, of computing two isogenies over a faster field. So to kind of um, motivate perhaps future work from people that are, that are uh, better at uh, arithmetic than, than I, um, in, in traditional ECC, we're, we're used to being able to just pick whatever primes we want. If there's an exponential number of curves over those primes, um, and so we can find secure, secure curves over any primes that look like this that are, that are very fast in, in software or hardware. Um, but in, in SIDH, we're kind, of, we're kind of restricted to primes that look like <coughs> this. And, and these primes prove to be somewhere between 1.5 and, and, and two times slower to implement the, the underlying field arithmetic. And if you, basically, if you get that speed up in the field arithmetic, it filters up through the whole, I mean, all of the implementation comes back to the finite field. So um, if we can speed up the field arithmetic, we get, a, we get that same speed up, roughly speaking, in the whole, the whole situation. And one thing um, that's kind of tempting, I, I mean, we could look at primes that look like this, but there's also primes that look friendly, that uh, at least to me, they, they look like they're almost friendly to SIDH implementation. So these primes that Hamburg picked um, to do fast ECC over, um, they they feel like they're almost SIDH friendly. So if you add one, um, which gives you the which gives you the group order here, you can imagine Alice in this case doing two to the two twenty four isogeny. So nothing different for Alice. Uh, but here the factorization is a bunch of different primes. Um, so this paper would allow you to at least do that in theory. But we'd need these primes to be um, small, uh, manageable enough to for for Alice to be able to um, to do the much faster field arithmetic here. So. I kind of want to pose a question to see if anyone out there can, can come up with SIDH friendly primes where um, perhaps this factorization is, is that the primes here are, are, are manageable. Um, even if one or two of the primes were too big to compute those isogenies, um, you, you can still ignore that in the SIDH implementations. And then one more slide on some, some related work. So um, I should say that uh, Dustin Moody and Dan Shumo had already figured essentially the analogue of all this out in the Edwards case um, uh, six years ago. So these Edwards, twisted Edwards curves and Montgomery curves are birationally equivalent. Um, so they've already done the analogous results uh, a long time ago. Their formulas are, are multiplicative as well and, and look really nice. Um, and recently Yoast has, um, among several other things, uh, essentially solved the last piece of the Montgomery puzzle. Um, we can now do three, we, we could before do three, five, any cyclic odd degree Montgomery isogeny, but there was a kind of a caveat in the two isogeny case that, um, that Yost has overcome. And just to tie this work back to, um, to Dustin's talk yesterday, 
Uh, I should say that there's a, a submission based on, on SIDH, um, but called psych, super singular isogeny key encapsulation. Uh, encapsulation. Um, it's the adaptive security, uh, the, the adaptively secure version of SIDH um, that was submitted to, to NIST last week. So uh, I would like to sort of promote more people to start looking into SIDH, uh, both from a constructive and, uh, and a crypto analytic point of view. And I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Questions? Comments? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, Thanks. Yeah. Beautifully illustrated talk. Um, so one of the, I mean, you have to compute the isogeny, and then you have to compute the image of two points, and the receiver has to be able to combine some appropriate linear combination of these points to get the kernel, right? Yes. So how do you deal with the sign ambiguity in the points when you drag them over? Ah, uh, so um, that kind of goes back to the paper from last year. We don't just drag the x coordinate. So if you're if the points that you want to compute the image of are p and q, um, we push them down to p1 with x p and x q. But we also drag through the x coordinate the difference. Oh, yeah. So we evaluate we evaluate the isogenies at, at basically three points all the way through. So um, and it seems like that might make the public keys bigger um, by one element of well, one fp squared element. Um, but those three. Those three uh, x coordinates uniquely determine the Montgomery curve where they are on that same line. Right. Yeah. Cool. More questions? Comments? still most efficient to stick with uh, two and three. Yeah. Um, the, only, the only potential for this work to be like immediately pla practically relevant is, at least in my mind, if someone comes along and finds really cool primes where, um, where that unbalancing thing could work. But at the moment, um, yeah, the, the, the speed up you could get in finding a different field isn't enough to justify moving away from, from three isogenies. In the paper, there's a whole section on showing that, um, how the performance slows down as these I think we computed up to um, degree 300 isogenies to show how the performance degrades relatively slowly, but um, it's still there, so, yeah. And, and so how does it come that it's paid off by both and paper, I think? Uh, how does it come that it's faster, even though it has a P minus 1, which is a, a multiple of 19? Yeah, so their P plus 1 was 2 to the something. 19 to the something, and it was about the same size as 2 to the something, 3 to the something. Basically, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how they, what the trick was that made the 19 power faster, but um, to give a sort of, I don't know, high level answer, I think what they were saying was we, we did Montgomery arithmetic on both of these primes, um, and we optimized it to a similar level, and the results were that the, the 19 power was faster. Um, it, it could, I, I don't know what the, what the trick was that made it. Maybe that power of 19 is, Close to a closer to a power of two than the power of three, or something like that, or maybe just the size of the prime um, was the reason. Because in SIDH, these these primes are sort of much more special. Like, there's not so many of them um, where p plus one is smooth like that. So they're much more scarce than what we're used to being able to, to cherry pick primes from. So maybe even the size of their of their prime was had played a part. But you'd have to read that paper and, and see. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.